So then, ultimately, the judge sentenced Bill Cosby, and he was sentenced to three to 10 years in state prison, plus fine $25,000 and the cost of prosecution, which was like $44,000. Not a lot of money for Bill. <laughs> That's not the main I'm point. not going to comment. Yeah. <laughs> but ultimately, he got three to 10 years in prison. When you heard three to 10, what did you think? I was furious. I mean, this man didn't belong in this courtroom being convicted and sentenced of anything. Um, the progressive injustice that went on in this case from the beginning, non-prosecution agreement, telling his lawyers and Mr. Cosby to rely on that agreement. It's, it's set in stone. Then the politics intrude. Then you, an opponent starts advertising, I'll go after Mr. Cosby if you elect me. And then one thing leads to another. And if you look at this from a distant perspective, it's an outrage, all of it. One outrageous thing leads to another outrageous thing, leads to another outrageous thing. And the politicization of the justice system becomes overwhelming. And, you know, my team and I would talk all the time about just the manifest injust injustice in this courtroom and the record we need to make. And the way this judge was trying to spin everything and the way the DA was trying to spin everything with unrelated accusations that can't be possibly investigated going back 30 years in other parts of the country. I mean, it was just a travesty of justice, a disgrace to the justice system, and it's been revealed for what it was, a bait and switch, something that should never, ever have gotten off the ground. And thank God it's been buried by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's exhaustive, detailed, compelling opinion. So Bill Cosby gets sentenced. He gets sent to prison to start his prison sentence. Uh, on June 25th, 2019, Cosby actually filed an appeal, right? Kind of shows that this was roughly two years ago when they filed the appeal. In 2021, he was up for parole, but the parole was denied. And I guess one of the reasons why the parole was denied was because Bill Cosby refused to take a sexual offender class in prison. And he refused to express remorse for something he never did. Yeah. He refused to take these courses because he said, I'm not guilty of this. I never did this. You know, um, he's a man of conviction. He, I mean, he could have played the game if he wanted to, to get released on parole to get out of there. And he refused to play any game. He said, I'm innocent. I never did this. I'm not going to say or do anything that suggests I'm guilty because I'm not. Right. I think OJ even spoke on and said that Bill should have taken those classes and, and get out early. And and Bill, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're talking about someone who's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, had been living, you know, the high life for most of his life, is 80-something years old, blind, and he's willing to sit all 10 years in prison to prove a point. Absolutely. This is a man of stellar conviction, stellar character. Um, you don't see people built like this too often. So then June 30th, 2021, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court found an agreement with the previous prosecutor to prevent Cosby from being charged in the case and overruled the conviction. The conviction. The Supreme Court's decision prevents him from being tried again on the same charges a third time. That's correct. When you heard that, that news, what'd you think? I was ecstatic, absolutely ecstatic. You know, I think most people who followed what the Pennsylvania Supreme Court was saying and doing about this case thought it was more likely that the reversal would be based on the unrelated accusers being allowed to testify, the judge increasing the number from one to five uh, to deny him a fair trial, which is what exactly what, he, what, what, what the judge did. Most people thought they would focus on those grounds and less on the agreement. But what they did was they focused on the agreement and they said, if this agreement is binding and enforceable, there's no reason to get to these other issues because the case is going to be thrown out and can't be retried. And that's exactly what they did. So explain to everyone what an appeal means. So from what I understand, when a judge rules a certain type of way and you appeal, a set of higher judges could actually review it and throw out that judge's decision. That's correct. What, what, an appeal is typically based on the transcript of the trial. Mm -hmm. You don't bring new evidence in in an appellate proceeding. It's based on the, heart, the, the plain wording of the transcripts. And a, a, another panel of judges gets the transcripts of the trial from day one till the end, 
and they and their staff and their researchers go through every page. They've, they first look at briefs filed by both sides. The defense files a notice of appeal, notifying everybody that there's going to be an appeal. A schedule is set. The defense files an appellate brief. The prosecution files a response to that appellate brief. Typically, the defense files a reply to that response. And other documents are sometimes filed, depending on what state you're in or what system you're talking about, federal or state. And eventually, there's oral argument after the appellate judges have a chance to read the briefs, read the transcripts, do their own research, their own inquiry into what went on and what didn't go on. And uh, it's a process, a world unto itself. And eventually, the appellate body of judges will rule as to whether they accept, in whole or in part, the appeal. How many judges voted on that in order to throw it out? Well, there was a, there was a first the appellate court, first the appellate court in, in that particular jurisdiction in Pennsylvania denied the appeal. Aha. Uh-huh. So a court of appeals denied it. And then it went to the, judges of the Supreme Court, and they reviewed, as I said before, everybody's briefs. They reviewed the transcripts of the evidence. They basically looked at what had happened in the trial court, looked at what had happened in the appellate court below them, and they had an oral argument at one point, which was December 1st or 2nd of last year, and the judges who attended question lawyers for both sides. And, you know, it was pretty obvious to me that they felt this had been an unfair trial. Let me, let me backtrack and say something else. Mm -hmm. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court only takes two to 4% of the appeals that are presented to it. In other words, these are cases where there was something happened at the trial level. uh, It went to an appellate court and then it went to the Supreme Court. They only accept two to four percent of the appeals that are presented to them. So that means very, very few cases progress from the appellate court to the Supreme Court. Right. They progress from the trial court to the appellate court, but very few to the Supreme Court, two to four percent. And if they take a case, you know they're very concerned about something. And They looked at all the issues raised by the appellate lawyers for Mr. Cosby. They decided to accept two issues out of all the issues that were presented to them. The two issues they said concerned them and the only two issues they said they would look at were allowing five unrelated accusers to testify for the prosecution in addition to the underlying accuser. and whether or not there was a binding agreement not to prosecute him that he and his lawyers relied on. The principle in law is called detrimental reliance. They were, they were bothered by the fact that Castor had testified under oath that I entered into a binding agreement, and I told them they have to rely on that agreement and give a deposition. They were very bothered by both of those principles. The questioning at oral argument before the Supreme Court seemed to be more about the five unrelated accusers. And they did question rather strongly about the whether or not there was an agreement not to prosecute, but it seemed like they spent more time and more energy on the allowance of five unrelated accusers. And so many people who watched it, like myself, said they think this was an unfair trial. They made that clear. They're probably going to issue a ruling primarily on the five unrelated accusers. And various legal organizations were filing briefs with the Pennsylvania Supreme Court asking them to provide guidance in the future about when it's permissible for a trial judge to call unrelated accusers in a criminal case because it's such prejudicial evidence. I mean, the Public Defenders Association asked the court for guidance. So many legal organizations around the country were anticipating an opinion that primarily focused on the five unrelated accusers. And what we got was an opinion that almost exclusively focused on the agreement not to prosecute. And 
once they said there was an agreement not to prosecute that he and his lawyers relied on to their detriment, what happened after that was inevitable. They would have to say, you cannot retry him. We're, we're enforcing this non-prosecution agreement. Now, if they had said, we think it was unjust to allow the prosecution to bring in five unrelated accusers, they could have said, you can try him again, but follow our principles of what's mm-hmm. right and what's fair. Yeah. But the ruling basically was, this should never have happened. It was a bait and switch. Mr. Cosby's right to fundamental fairness under the Constitution was denied. None of this should have happened. There should have been not one trial, not two trials, not an appellate process. He should never have gone to prison. He should never have been sentenced. They said it's all a nullity. The case should never have been brought. His his conviction is vacated. He's to be released from prison forthwith, and he's not to be retried. It was a very powerful, very stunning decision that people around the country are still reading Hmm. because they basically said, we're not going to allow prosecutors to put a defendant through a hustle, a bait and switch, a a con artist type hustle, where now you see an agreement not to prosecute, now you don't. This is not justice, this is not America, and they seem very strong about uh, what they felt should have happened and what should not have happened. But again, I'm emphasizing, as I have before, This man went through a charge, an arrest, having to find an attorney and a a, a defense team. He went through all the rigors of pretrial process in a criminal case. He went through a trial. It was a mistrial. He had to do it again. There had to be a second trial. He had to go through the motions, the court appearances, the argument among lawyers. Then a second jury had to be picked. He goes through a second trial. They come back guilty. He has to be sentenced. Then the appellate process starts. You go through appellate lawyers. They make their arguments in the trial court. They make their arguments in the appellate court. They make their arguments in the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, he's languishing in prison for almost three years. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the highest court in the state of Pennsylvania says, none of this should have happened throw it all out, free him immediately, and don't you dare retry him on this case. It's a stunning set of events, but he should never have been put through this ordeal, ever.